Welcome to Ops 105 Virtualized and Hybrid Backup Deep Dive. Let's get started. Today's presenter is Ben Armstrong, and he's a Principal Program Manager Lead for AKS HCI. He's also been insanely responsible for most of Microsoft's virtualization efforts over the last decade and maybe a half, almost two. Anyway, Ben, take it away. And I, I, I do not like being told I'm responsible for things because I'm <laughs> not responsible. Uh, but uh, good to be here today. Uh, super excited to, to be able to, to chat about some, some architecture, some details. Um, so hi everyone, Ben Armstrong here. Uh, you know, as Aaron mentioned, I uh, currently working on AKS HCI, so I am hoping that towards the end of this conversation, we'll be able to chat about containers and, and where things are going in this space. Uh, but yeah, I have been uh, been working on virtualization for forever. Um, I, I was telling uh, Aaron at the beginning of this that uh, almost 20 years, uh, uh, 20 years uh, in, uh, nine months, two days. Nine months, two days. I will have been working on virtualization for for twenty years. Not that I'm counting. Uh, I, think, I think people forget that virtualization has been around that long. Like this is not a new thing. No, and it, the really like the really fun thing is like when I started working on virtualization, working at a, a startup company in Silicon Valley. Like we we had a couple of guys on the team who were like old IBM and, and Amdahl guys who are like sitting here going like, ah, I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> they're, they're all retired now. Uh, so, but, you know, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, still lots of fun. Uh, it's still exciting. And today we're going to be talking about backup, but we're also like largely uh, talking about like uh, uh, data and, and how to manage data uh, in kind of this virtualized world. So uh, with that, shall I jump in? Go for it. Awesome. Uh, you know, so uh, talking about like uh, 20, uh, 20 years working on this and the change and so on. And one of the things that I like to chat to people about is I like to say that like, uh, you know, for all the work that we've done in virtualization, at the end of the day, uh, there are only two things that matter to our customers. And I'm going to start throwing stuff on my whiteboard now. Uh, and there are two things that matter to people. The first one is uh, their apps. I've got this nice little ball here, which for this talk is going to be your app. You have a server app uh, and you need to, to run it somewhere. Um, and uh, the second thing that you have that you care about is the data for that app. Um, so I have an app. It does some stuff. Most of the time, there is data associated with it. Uh, you know, when I look at everything that's that's gone on in the world of virtualization and now with containers, I, all we're really about is trying to make it easier for you to deploy your apps and manage your data. Uh, you know, and if you go back, you know, 25 years ago, uh, you know, and I do, I, I, this is a conversation I have uh, a lot because often when I'm talking to people, about like you know moving to containers containerizing their apps uh and, and we're talking through all the details uh people are like oh this this seems complicated like there's a lot of work here uh, and i like to point out they're like yeah 25 years ago if you want to deploy a new server application the first thing that you had to do was write out a business justification to explain why you were about to go spend money buying a new physical server don't tell me this is complicated like you know, it used to be a lot worse, uh, but you know, for a, a lot of folk and for a lot of apps, that's the world where we started. With. You know, you have your app, you have uh, a physical server, and you have uh, physical disks um, attached to it. And you know, even way back then, you know, we were very aware about the fact that, like, okay. Apps are the easy part, <laughs> you know, like uh, you can deploy an app, you can run an app, and um, that's the easy part. The hard part is the data. You know, the hard part is the like, how do I make sure that my data is where it needs to be uh, for apps? 
Um, how do I make sure that uh, if something goes wrong, I can get my data back? Uh, that's the, the hard part. Uh, and, you know, so if we go back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, the, the answer to, to everyone's uh, problems was like, go out and get a really nice, expensive sink. Um, they're magic. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, when we, uh, when we think about where we are today with like hybrid cloud and, and so on, um, in a lot of ways, I actually look at the SAN industry and go like, they were ahead of their times in one aspect. And that when I went out and, and talked to customers about like, hey, you're spending a lot of money on your SANs. Like, why, why are you doing this? Uh, on one hand, customers would come back and be like, well, it has these features and this feature and this feature and this feature. But on the other hand, you chat to people and they'd be like, well, why do I pay for the same? Because it's a managed service. Okay, they didn't have a managed service, but that's what it was. Like you paid someone money for your SAN and then like you didn't have to manage it anymore because if there was a hardware failure, someone would arrive in a car and fix it for you. I remember hearing that the most expensive thing in a lot of data centers at one point in time was storage. And it's sort of like the moment you have the most expensive thing in a data center, you've put a big target on your back. Absolutely. I, I, I remember uh, like around, uh, around 2010, 2012, when we were uh, starting to work on storage spaces direct and starting to work on scale out file server um, and all of that. I used to chat to people and I used to say like, Whatever uh, size deployment you're at, um, whether you're like a, a Fortune 100 company or whether you're a, a mom and pop running servers under under your stairs or in the back room, uh, there are two facts that I can tell you about storage. The first fact is there is a perfect solution out there for you, and the second fact is it is more than you want to pay for. <laughs> That, that is so true. And then when you start talking about backing up all that data, my husband used to manage the robotic tape silo because all that data had to go on to tape and then all the tapes had to go somewhere else off site. And that was how we used to do backups. Yeah, no, absolutely. My uh, one of, not my first IT job, but one of my early IT jobs, I was actually a uh, server admin for a division of uh, the University of Queensland, local people. Uh, and one of my jobs was maintaining the tape backups. Um, and God bless, we had one secretary who at least once a week would delete a business critical file. Uh, so we got to we got to test our tape backup system uh, quite thoroughly because at least once a week we'd get a call and be like, ah, hey, chaos. Uh, but so that's that's where uh, a lot of us uh, started. Um, but then uh, virtual machines uh, came along. Um, and let's kind of step through the journey of that. So virtual machines, uh, just take this diagram and just make it more complicated. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the jokes I often like to make is uh, I work with a team of engineers where we believe that any problem can be solved by just adding a couple of extra operating systems. That'll make things better. Uh, <laughs> so with virtual machines, let's, let's uh, spread out this diagram because um, we now have uh, we have our app, uh, which is running on a virtual machine, which is running on a physical computer. But this virtual machine now has a virtual hard drive uh, that's running on a physical uh, hard drive. So I've now got all these uh, extra layers in here. Um, and this raises like a real question about, actually, let me center this for now. Um, this raises a real question about like, okay, what does, what does backup uh, uh, mean uh, in, the, in this world? Um, and when we first started working on virtualization, when uh, I was uh, part of the team that built Virtual Server, uh, the precursor to, to Hyper-V, um, our answer was quite simple. We just looked at that and we're like, that is, that is complicated and that is hard. Uh, customers, if you want to back up uh, just run some backup software inside your virtual machine and ig ignore that this world exists. Uh, which as engineers, we were like, problem solved. 
uh, pizza. Uh, but we, uh, what we didn't contend for uh, was one that our customers wouldn't be happy with that answer. Uh, but two, uh, we saw a fascinating thing happening with our customers uh, as they were bringing their applications from physical machines over to, to virtual machines. And what we discovered was that uh, anyone who's worked in the server industry, like tried and true best practice that we talk about is one application per server, one function per server. Like you want a file server, single server. You want DHCP server, single server. You want a web server, single server. Like that is that is textbook. That is being textbook uh, since the, the beginning of time. Uh, but fun thing about industry best practices and textbook stuff uh, is that often we don't follow them, and we just don't tell anyone that we're not following. Them. Like you you go to you go to like user groups and you go to conferences. And people are like, well, of course, everyone does it this way. And everyone sits there and goes like, yeah. And then they go home and they don't do that. Um, so it turns out that like pre-virtualization, we had a lot of people who were saying, oh, yeah, one one function per server. But then in reality, we're going, like, I got a big server. I'm going to put a bunch of apps on there. If I had a dollar for every time I saw SQL Server installed on the same server that Exchange was installed yeah. on, I'd have a lot of dollars. Yeah. So, but what happened was when we started bringing out virtualization and people could, uh, it enabled people to simultaneously uh, follow this best practice of one app per server while still using their hardware efficiently. Um, and so what we actually saw was that as people migrated from physical service to virtual machines, there was like this explosion of the number of systems. You know, and we would see customers where like they had 20 physical servers and they would virtualize them into 120 virtual servers. Uh, and on one hand, like that was good. They were now they were following best practices, they had like more isolation between these workloads, like failure scenarios were better, like patch manager, like a, a whole bunch of things became better. Um, but on the other hand, um, you had this problem that where like, if you thought about the traditional backup approach, you went from, I have 20 servers I need to back up to I have 120 servers I need to back up. And so customers came to us very strongly and they were like, we need a way to to back up these systems in a more efficient manner. And that actually, that started the beginning of a fairly complicated journey as we tried to figure out how to do this. Um, and so the, the first thing, uh, I'll, I'll take a pause uh, at this moment uh, to just kind of bring people up to speed on a piece of esoteric technology um, that uh, you may be well versed in, um, but you may not be well versed in. Um, and so jumping over to my diagram, um, the technology is a lovely thing uh, that people in the Windows world know, uh, which is uh, VSS. Um, VSS is my favorite three letter acronym for a four word title. Arm Volume down your copy services. Yeah, give the man a try. Volume shadow copy services. VSS, the, the copy just got dropped along the way somewhere. Uh, so VSS is infrastructure that Microsoft built back in the day of SANS, where we had all these different manufacturers producing different ways to handle backup efficiently. We had all these different backup vendors who wanted to interact with them. And we wanted to create a platform that would enable this ec ecosystem. Um, and so we came up with uh, VSS. Um, and VSS, uh, under the covers, uh, can be broken down uh, into uh, three different categories. Um, so let's get rid of this. Um, you have the VSS requester, the VSS 
uh, writer and the VSS provider. What what are these things and how do they they fit in into this picture? So the VSS provider is the thing that sits on top of your storage and says, I know how to take a snapshot of my state. So I have a VSS provider down here uh, that Windows can call into and say, take a snapshot of my state. The VSS writer is the thing that is attached to the app that you're running. Um, and it is uh, allows your app to get ready to have a backup. So if you're running SQL, it has a VSS writer. If you're running Exchange, it has a VSS writer. Um, all these and different parts of Windows have VSS writers where uh, you can call into them and say, hey, we're about to snapshot the storage, uh, get ready. Um, and then we have the VSS requester, um, more commonly known as your backup software of choice. Uh, so your backup software of your choice, whether it's the inbuilt backup, whether it's DPM, or whether it's a third party offering is the VSS requester. And the VSS requester, when it decides that it's time to take a backup, uh, goes to your app, uh, goes to all your apps and says, hey, get ready for backup. And when all the apps come back and say, we're ready, goes to the storage and says, uh, okay, take a snapshot, we're good. So uh, how did we start thinking about this uh, with virtual machines? Well, the first approach that we took um, was we said, okay, what we're gonna do um, is, you know, cause we, we had this problem that you have your VSS requester, your backup software, uh, running here, um, and it can't see the VSS writers inside your virtual machine. It just sees these virtual machines, um, and it's like, those things are weird, uh, but I don't see any apps here. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll do a backup, call into the VSS provider, take a snapshot, um, and all the apps inside the virtual machines were not ready for it. It's a train wreck. Um, and so what we did uh, was we were like, okay, what we will do is we'll do two things. Uh, the first thing we'll do is we are going to make a uh, Hyper-V uh, VSS writer. And it's gonna sit here so that it can tell the backup software, hey, VMs are apps too. Like if, if, you're, if you're backing up the system, you need to talk to us so that we can make sure that your VMs are ready. Um, then the second thing that we did was we actually created a little itty bitty VSS requester, basically a, 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 a stub a backup program, uh, which we call our backup integration component um, that runs inside the virtual machine. So we have that. So now what happens, and what I'm describing here is actually the technology kind of as it was uh, in Windows Server 2008, uh, 2008 R2. Um, so now what happens is uh, your, your VSS requester, uh, your backup software comes to Windows and is like, hey, I wanna do backups. Like what apps are here that I need to backup? And Windows come back and it lists its apps. And among it, it says, oh, there's a bunch of VMs here that you need to back up. And that's this writer. And it goes, great. So now when it goes to backup, it calls in and it says, hey, Hyper-V, back up your VMs. Hyper-V, in turn, like shunts this message over to the backup IC, which inside the virtual machine repeats this process. Goes through, calls into all the VSS writers, says like, get ready and they all get ready, we return back and we say, we're ready. And then VSS calls in and says, great, take a snapshot of the hardware. So that all sounds good, right? Problem solved. Uh, well, not quite, because things get a little bit weird here. Uh, because the way VSS is de uh, designed uh, with these three components, uh, 
it's actually designed with a very tight like window for taking the snapshot. Um, specifically, uh, when uh, when the VSS requester calls into the writers and says, "Get ready for a snapshot," uh, the writers come back and say, "Okay, I'm ready, and I am waiting for 10 seconds." You got 10 seconds to take your snapshot, uh, and then I'm off and running. And so what would actually happen in this scenario is that often when we took the snapshot on the physical hardware, uh, the virtual machine had already resumed running. We missed the moment. The, like we, we had a clean backup moment, uh, but it was actually gone. Um, so what we actually did to handle that um, is, uh, and I'm going to jump over to another page here. Uh, so let's imagine I, I have this machine. It had a bunch of virtual machines on it, uh, which had a bunch of virtual hard disks. Um, and I, they're all running on my storage. And I took a snapshot, but unfortunately, the snapshot happened 30 seconds after they were ready for a backup. Uh, so what we actually did was we implemented some code in our in our VSS writer, in the Hyper-V VSS writer, where we said, okay, when the snapshot is done, uh, you need to go into that snapshot and you need to go through every virtual hard drive that's in that snapshot. And one by one, you need to mount it, connect it to the host, and roll it back to that clean moment. And then once it's clean, return it to the back uh, to the backup. Um, so we would go through and we would do uh, that pro uh, processing. It was a, a post snapshot processing event where we would go in and we would clean up uh, all those virtual hard drives. Um, and on one hand, that kind of worked, um, but on the other hand, as we're getting towards the end of two thousand eight or two and getting towards twenty twelve what we were seeing was that computers were getting bigger and bigger and systems were getting bigger and bigger and people were running more and more virtual machines uh, and as they were running more and more virtual machines the number of virtual hard drives that we were having to clean up on a backup was getting larger and larger and larger and larger and we're like a problem you know because we were now seeing systems where like as part of like the post operation on backup we were having to like mount and clean up like hundreds of virtual hard drives. Um, and we were having all sorts of issues uh, come up. Uh, and I mean, like just to highlight, uh, uh, R and Sonia, if you took a, a server and hot plugged in 200 hard drives and then hot removed 200 hard drives, no problems, right? That's going to work perfectly every time. No. Yeah, all the the issues we found, like so many fun and unusual bugs. Uh, so as as we were coming into to 2012, we were like, okay, uh, we need to do something to get rid of this post backup cleanup phase. It's it's causing us problems, um, and we came up with this great idea where we were like. We know what we can do. We're going to change the Hyper-V virtual hard drive to stop being a hard drive and start being a SAN. And what we actually did, this is a really fun thing. If you actually uh, go digging through the device IDs, uh, in twi the change actually happened in 2012R2. Um, in 2012R2, uh, virtual hard drives inside virtual machines stopped presenting themselves as SATA devices, and they started presenting themselves as SAS devices. Uh, and what we actually did was we said, okay, the virtual controller for the virtual hard drive for the virtual machine is now better, and it knows how to do snapshots. And we actually implemented a, oh, not that one, we implemented a Hyper-V uh, VSS provider. Um, side note, uh, this made the VSS team 
uh, super excited uh, because when we did this, we became the first software team to ever implement all three components um, of the VSS stack. And we also gave them a perfect test framework where like they could now like very easily try out every bed and, and so on. Um, so now in 2012 or two, um, now what happens is VSS request, your backup software. Because I want to back up. Windows comes back and says, I got a bunch of virtual machines. It says, okay, backup virtual machine. That message comes over here. Our mini fake backup software says, okay, all your apps back up. And when the apps are go doing their like 10 second holding breath, uh, this guy actually would call down into the Hyper-V VSS provider and say, okay, take a snapshot of just the virtual hard drives with this virtual machine. And once it had done that, it would come back to here and say, okay, here are the files that you need. Um, this was a massive change in 2012 or two. It took something that was a very intense, very, you know, like lockstep synced process and made it hugely scalable. And it greatly improved the reliability um, uh, of, of backup. So that, that was a huge win. So in uh, that case then, was that all seamless to the backup vendors? Because you put it down to that layer, it sounds like they wouldn't have had to have made any changes because they're just still requesting the same thing from the Hyper-V VSS right now. Yeah, ab absolutely. From, oh. from the backup vendor point of view, um, all they saw was that things just became a lot more reliable. <laughs> this is a good um, thing. What you want to do as a platform provider. Um, so that kind of got us to, to 2012 or two. Um, but around that time um, was also uh, when, you know, you know go back in your, your Wayback Machine, flashback, uh, was also around the time that people were starting to get serious about cloud computing. And when hybrid cloud was starting to be a conversation, um, it was also like really early days of the big data conversation. Uh, and one of the things that was starting to come up in these conversations was, oh my gosh, our backups are huge. Like, have you seen how much data our backups take? Have you seen? Like how long it takes to make a backup because like there's so much data to transfer. Um, I I I remember a time when a gigabyte was an unconscionably large amount of data. Yeah, uh, and when when you had systems where the backups made a noticeable performance impact on the system when the backups were running, regardless of whether or not that system was initiating the backup or was just subject to being backed up, you literally yep. started running out of that time window where there's only 24 hours in the day and the business were about to walk back through the door again. Yeah, abs absolutely. So like coming out of 2012 or two, as we were like thinking about uh, 2016, um, that was kind of top of mind for us. We were like, and you know, what we were, uh, what we were really seeing at that stage was we had a bunch of our, our partners and backup vendors who were trying to solve this problem themselves. Um, and you know, some were successful, some were struggling, people were, you know, having different approaches. Um, and so in 2016, uh, we introduced a, a new uh, technology uh, for Hyper-V, um, which is uh, RCT. Uh, and RCT uh, stands for Resilient Tra uh, Change Tracker. Um, now, I am not going to do justice to RCT today. Um, I will say, uh, of all of this diagram, uh, RCT is actually one thing, one of a few bits where there is an amazing uh, tech ed session uh, on RCT. Uh, it uh, was Tech Ed Europe. We had one of the guys uh, who was working on this, Taylor Brown, uh, do a session. If you want to dig in deep on RCT, uh, you can uh, go look that up. 
Um, when, you know, if you look up, you know, Hyper-V, Backup, uh, Brand Bag, there's a couple of them out there. Uh, yeah, we'll track out those links and add them to the video. Yeah. So, but uh, RCT, uh, like to, to give the simple version um, of RCT, uh, RCT provided an API um, for backup vendors. So like, you know, we still have this VSS flow, we still have all this going, um, but with RCT, we provided backup vendors the ability that when they would call in and they would say, hey, Hyper-V, like, like take a backup of this virtual machine. Um, and we would go off and do our stuff and we would come back and we would say, okay, we've, we've done a backup of this virtual machine. Here's the backup. Um, RCT allowed vendors to come in and say like, okay, you gave me that backup, which is lovely, but can you tell me what are the specific bits of the hard drive that have changed since the last time I took a backup? Uh, and that's RCT stands for Resilient Change Tracker. Uh, it is a, a log that runs where we don't track the data that has changed, we just track which sectors of the hard drive have changed since the last time someone took a backup. And so backup vendors can be like, I agree, like you just like, I asked for a backup and you just gave me a, you know, 30 gig VHD, um, which bits of this have changed? And with RCT, we can come back and be like, oh, 200 meg, this 200 meg, this 200 meg is the different 200 meg. And that's then allowed people to build efficient backup solutions where they can go like, okay, like, we still have our last backup sitting over there, like in our backup service. Um, so rather than copying the 30 gig, let's go in, get the data that's changed and, and ship that data um, so that we can be a lot more efficient. So that kind of gets us to like 2016 uh, for backup. Um, and we're now getting close to uh, the modern day world. Um, and so we're now gonna switch over to a bit of a, a more cloud oriented uh, conversation. Um, so one of the, the fun things uh, with all this conversation uh, that I'm always talking to people about and it shocks me uh, that this message uh, doesn't seem to land. In fact, let me, I'm gonna, gonna turn tables. Uh, hey, Aaron, Sonia, what, 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 uh, like people say that public cloud is just other people's computers, right? Like when I run something in public cloud, I'm running it on a bunch of other people's computers. Yep. So, and, and Azure is our public cloud? Yes. So, so pub quiz, what is the operating system running on the computers in our public cloud? A skew of Windows? Yeah, Windows Server. Windows Server, baby. And what is, uh, when you start a virtual machine, what's the software that that virtual machine is running in? Hyper-V. 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 Um, yay. And not only uh, is it Windows Server and Hyper-V, it is literally the same Hyper-V. Like the number of times I have to tell people that it's like, no, we don't have like a special Hyper-V that runs in Azure. Like it, you get, like if you go out and get like the Windows Server Insiders build and get like the, the latest, like those are the bits that we run in Azure. Um, and so, you know, it's really funny when I talk to people and they're like, so how does this work in Azure? And like, well, we have virtual machines and we attach virtual hard drives. And like, as we come over to Azure, um, a lot of this technology uh, looks the same. Um, you know, Azure uses virtual machines, it uses virtual hard drives. Um, the we do have uh hopefully it comes as a surprise to no one we don't have a bunch of sands uh in azure uh <laughs> we do have uh our own cloud storage 
uh, solutions um, uh, that we run uh, in Azure. Um, now, and one of the things, uh, and once again, I'm not going to dig into cloud storage in Azure. They're actually, uh, if you're curious about how we do storage, uh, Mark Rasinovich has done an awesome set of uh, presentations over the years at different events uh, talking about the architecture uh, of Azure. Uh, but, and, and he talks about storage there. Um, and so I would really uh, encourage folk um, to, to look into that. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Azure storage, um, I'm going to clean up this diagram uh, a bit, is uh, I often uh, get people um, uh, asking about like, hey, does Azure use uh, VHD or VHDX files or like what's the file format that's used inside Azure? Uh, and the, the interesting thing to understand here is that um, if you think about uh, a SAN, like most people have a fair understanding of a SAN, uh, a SAN is actually a fancy server that exposes objects to the network that look like physical disks. Like that's their their object of virtualization. Um, so Azure storage exposes objects to the network that look like virtual disks. Um, and so to the question of like, uh, does Azure use VHD or VHDX? The answer is kind of neither and both. Um, it has a, a class of, of virtualization that exposes uh, virtual disks. Um, but a lot of the concepts are the same. Um, and we've been working uh, in Azure to expose a lot of the same capabilities. So you can now go into Azure, you can have a virtual machine, you can ask for it to be backed up. We efficiently take the, the snapshot and we, and we store the snapshot. Um, we've also been using our investments and in stuff like RCT to enable efficient backup of your virtual machines running uh, in your data center uh, up to Azure. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, it's all about uh, that efficient uh, data transfer. But at this stage, I do want to switch over to talking about containers. But before I do, um, I'll uh, pause and see if Arna or Sonia have anything they want to poke me about before I move on to containers. Um, no, not really. I think that you're you're covering it pretty well in terms of at least understanding. And I'm assuming that, as you said, that the backup infrastructure, the way that it's backed up in Azure, is basically sort of like a scaled up version of how it's been backed up on a, a server 2019 instance, for example. Yeah, absolutely. The 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 fun thing um, of like everything gets a bit strange at massive scale. Um, you know, so the interesting thing about when you think about backup in Azure as opposed to the way that um, most people think about backup um, is that there are a lot of places in Azure where the way we handle availability and the way we handle backup um, is by just keeping a million copies of things laying around. Um, because you can keep a million copies of things uh, laying around. Um, I will not name names because I don't like to publicly shame, and also it's a company secret. I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, but there was uh, there was a, a case a number of years ago uh, that I was involved in, where uh, a, a team building an Azure service um, accidentally checked in code that was just randomly deleting their own data. Um, but Azure Storage was doing such a good job of keeping redundant copies that it actually kept ahead of their own code deleting data. And so the only thing that the service team noticed was they were like, we're not seeing the, the performance we think we should see. Like we're seeing much lower IO. 
than we would expect. And when they dug in, it's like, oh my gosh, like our IO is low because we write something and then like 30 seconds later, we delete it and then Azure covers for us and restores it and we didn't notice. Uh, and that's why we don't have Silverlight as a service. <laughs> not, I'm not naming names. Um, so uh, there, like, there are different things at scale, but from a fundamental concepts uh, point of view, uh, it's very similar. Um, so now, um, let me. I'm going to jump over to a new page. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, containers. Um, and I didn't get a handy diagram ready for this. Um, I'm just I'm just enjoying the trip down memory lane, and it's really interesting yeah. to see that once we stepped into the world of virtualization, and you started to uncover the problems at scale as this got bigger. It's not, it doesn't seem like it was a huge jump from that once that problem was solved to a cloud based. And I think everybody assumes that we've invented the cloud from scratch, where it seems like, from a backup and storage perspective, it's more of an evolution of what we'd already had in place for virtualization. Oh, yeah, one, 100%. You know, 100%. It's, you know, it's, it's like, a lot of people ask me about like Ben, how like you've been doing the same job for twenty years. Like, how is that uh, even possible? Um, and you know the the there are a couple of answers that I give to that. Um, the the first one is because like even though I've been doing the same job for twenty years, like the world is changing, the industry is changing, like everything like is changing around me. And, you know, the, uh, at no point in time could I have predicted what problems we would be solving in two years' time. Um, and often, you know, what we're solving today, if you went back five years ago and asked me if we could solve that, I would have said, no, that, that's impossible. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, examples of this in the space of storage um is you know if you if you had talked to me and like while we were working on hyper b in windows over 2008 r2 and you had said hey ben like we got this customer escalation where uh customers like got a deployment where they have some flaky storage and the storage falls over occasionally and when the storage falls over the entire system goes down like, what can we do to help them? I would have deadpan looked at you and said, get better storage. Um, but then as we started scaling up and scaling up and scaling up, what we realized is that it's like, that happens and that's unavoidable. Like, and we need to think of ways to survive that. Um, and so in uh, in Windows uh, Windows Server 2016, uh, we put a bunch of work in there so that and I I demoed this on stage and I still think it's kind of black magic um, where we made it so that virtual machines can survive massive storage failure, uh, which is really cool. Like we did like we did all this work where we're like okay like. If the storage goes away, like we will detect it and we'll pause the virtual machine and we'll halt the storage IO and we'll put it in like uh, suspended critical so that, you know, an admin storage, when the storage returns, the virtual machine resumes running. Um, you know, but it's like, yeah, it's it's been a constant learning, but it's also, yeah, building on top of, you know, all the stuff that we, we built previously. So moving over to container, my favorite topic right now. Um, so uh, one of the, the greatest uh, misnomers um, is, and I, I have talked to many people about this, is they go, uh, containers? Ben, why are you talking about containers when we're talking about hybrid backup and data? Because containers are stateless, right? No. 
no. Like any any app worth running has state. Um, what what is has really happened with containers, uh, which is lovely, is that containers have their state somewhere else. Yeah. And so for most people, what this looks like is I have a container, it runs my app, um, and the data for that is over here in the SQL database. Um, and so, yeah, my container is stateless. I can restart it as often as I want, um, but that database still exists. Um, and and it needs to be to be backed up uh, and managed. Um, now that's a very simple uh, diagram, but the real world is a lot more complicated. Um, so let's start talking about uh, how we view this uh, with uh, AKS HCI. So with AKS HCI, you know, first we're going to start with uh, our foundation of, uh, we have, I mean, is it, yeah, right number. So we have a handful of physical computers uh, that we're going to install Azure Stack HCI on. Uh, got the latest, greatest you know, Microsoft uh, on prem cloud solution. Um, each of these physical computers is going to have a bunch of local disks. Um, and Azure Stack HCI is going to use storage spaces direct um, to put them into one big uh, pool of virtual storage um, that I can use. So we, we have Azure Stack HCI. Um, we have our storage spaces direct storage uh, running there and life is good. Um, so you're going to come along and you're going to say, I want to uh, install AKS HCI on. Um, and for AKS HCI, um, as you create uh, Kubernetes clusters, we're going to make sets of virtual machines um, that we're going to use to run containers. Now, these will either be Windows virtual machines or Linux virtual machines, depending on what you tell us. Um, and above this, and I still forgot to put my container. Actually, let me quickly fix this. Oh, I lost it. There we go. Um, and you're going to run your containers uh, on this. So, um, as we already alluded to, the containers, yes, technically the container itself is stateless, it's just that your state uh, is somewhere else. Um, so what does somewhere else look like? Um, well, there are, are three models uh, that we see customers doing. Um, the first model, uh, certainly the easiest one, is that maybe your data is running off on a completely different system. You have a different system uh, that is your, your SQL uh, database. Um, and that's nice and simple. You have your containers running over here. You have your SQL database uh, over here. Um, that certainly makes life easy from a backup and data management point of view uh, because you just back up and manage uh this um what it does not make simple at all is the amount of network traffic that you're going to have coming out of uh this uh aks hci cluster um and, and going to that sql database um and that is actually what pushes a lot of people away from this model you know it's just the like oh my gosh like every every like every piece of data that any of these apps need is now going over a network connection uh, to this. So so what can we what can we do about that? Well, the first thing that we see people doing, I'm gonna put these uh, closer together. These four virtual machines are my AKS HCI deployment. Um, as one of the great things about Azure Stack HCI is not only can it run AKS HCI, it can run VMs. Um, so they go fine. Like I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna put pair of virtual machines uh, on here. Uh, I'm gonna create a virtualized SQL cluster 
um, and I'm going to, uh, you know, have my containers access that. Cool. Um, this is perfectly viable solution. Um, and this is actually what we see uh, a lot of our customers doing. Um, and now, you know, I use the backup model I talked about to, to back up these virtual machines um, and my containers access the data in them. Um, but uh, my hope is that this isn't where most people stop uh, because there really, there are two other ways to handle this. Uh, the first one, uh, the next one is my favorite way um, is to go, you know what? I, uh, I'm going to deploy AKS HCI on my system. Uh, I'm going to, I have a bunch of apps uh, that I'm going to run. Um, but I am also, uh, on top of AKS HCI, I am going to uh, deploy uh, ARC enabled data services. Um, because what does, what does ARC enabled data services give me in this picture? It gives you a containerized database. Uh, you can use Arc enabled data services to spin up uh, SQL managed instances on top of this cluster. So now you got SQL running here. Um, so on one hand, this is really cool because now I can have you know application specific SQL databases. Um, I can like tweak and tune them. Uh, it's all managed in my environment. Um, but this might have you going, but wait a second. Where's the data? Where's the data? That, that is a good question. Um, so let me answer the, where's the data? Like when I do ARC enabled data services, uh, hint, it's not up in Azure because you don't have that thing. Um, so what's actually happening, um, is, um, we have, uh, for each of these virtual machines, uh, they each have a, a system drive um, that uh, AKS HCI manages for you. We keep it patched, we keep it up to date. Um, uh, you never see that. Um, but they, they each have a system drive that's a virtual hard drive. Um, but what we also do is when we're running ARC enabled uh, data services and they're wanting to spin up uh, these SQL containers. As part, you know, when you go through ARC enabled data services and you say, I want a SQL managed instance, um, what actually happens is ARC enabled data services uh, comes into AKS HCI and says, uh, Excuse me, uh, I need some persistent storage. I'm going to do something in a container where I need persistent storage. Um, and being Microsoft, we go, you know what's good at persistent storage? Uh, VHDX, like we got you. So we provision a VHDX file uh, for each instance, uh, for each SQL managed instance. And then, let me, Make my numbers match. A little bit OCD about the accuracy of my diagrams. Um, so we now have each of these instances of SQL running in a container um, has its virtual hard drive uh, where its daughter is going to get persistent. Now this virtual hard drive is being stored on the storage spaces direct volume. So like it's got redundancy protection, it's got high performance, it's awesome. And then what happens is, as we start the uh, an individual SQL uh, instance, first we hot plug the VHD to whichever VM where that container is running. Now, handily, Hyper-V supports you know hot plug and remote. Um, so we hot plug the VHD, and then through AKS HCI we call in and we wire this all up. We tell this container, oh by the way your storage is over there. And by doing this, we get to leverage all of the infrastructure over here that I talked about. 
And so when you need to take a backup of the system, well, it's just backing up virtual machines and attached virtual hard drives. So you can now come in here and say like, I need to back up the system and we have all the technology we need. And bringing it back to where you started the conversation, of course, with the problems of detaching and reattaching virtual hard drives, we've solved the problem with attaching and reattaching virtual hard drives at scale in this end of the technology where we had a challenge with it back in the 2008 days. Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's really one of the, and, and Sonia, you touched on this, uh, as kind of the, the journey to public cloud and then how that has benefited, um, you know, our, our hybrid cloud and our, our on-prem um, users. Um, it's one of the things that I find particularly fascinating is that, uh, and the work with containers is a great example. Um, often what has happened is we will have built a solution initially, you know, in 2012, you know, for, for small private clouds. Um, and then we'll bring that across to Azure and there's a huge amount of engineering work uh, to scale up, you know, and get the reliability and so on so that we can do things at Azure scale. And then we find new scenarios on-prem like this, where we're like, oh, we like we have a problem solved. And handily, we now have this great tool in the toolbox where we know we can we can solve that problem with it. Um, and so uh, technology like goes between those two environments uh, all the time. And that's that's one of the things that I think um, makes Microsoft's hybrid story so darn impressive is we own the operating system and we own the Azure cloud. So we have this advantage of being able to you know, look at advantages between those two technologies and, and merge them seamlessly so that both of our cloud customers and our on-prem customers and our hybrid customers will benefit. I know that you know, talking to a lot of customers who maybe thought that the cloud story was, you know, I, I have to lift and shift or I have to refactor all my apps and I have to, to go fully cloud. Um, and to see that that's not the case and to remind people that there are so many things that we are doing and innovating that we then bring back into hybrid and on-prem scenarios back into Windows Server with all the updates that it has had as well. I think a few people are starting to turn the lights on now about being able to dip their toe in the in the cloud waters and get a whole bunch of benefits for their on-prem environments that, that being hybrid gives them. I know I'm going to echo a lot of what you said. You know, it's the fact that, you know, Microsoft, uh, like Microsoft has always had a huge heart and passion for enterprises running servers uh, in, in in their environments, uh, solving problems locally. Um, the fact that we've been able to marry that with we're also doing hyperscale cloud, um, and the we're using the same software um, in in both places. Um, it gives us a huge amount of flexibility here. Um, and it's, you know, uh, there's been a number of folk I, I, I talk to uh, who are like old curmudgeons like me who are starting to go bold on top, where it's like, we were all there when it was like, do you, do you remember when like, like thin workstations were going to be the thing and we we're like centralizing everything and thin workstations and then now it's like, oh no. Uh, it, it, it's like, you know, anyone who's been in the industry for a period of time knows that, like, yeah, the, like, the world changes, like, our business expectations change, and uh, the right uh, architectural solution uh, today might not be the right architectural solution in three, four years' time. Uh, I'll, I'll always remember, I, like, I spend... Uh, I spent a lot of time chatting with customers, but also chatting with the engineering team. And, you know, one of the things that the the engineering team is always looking for from me 
is to get some insight into like, hey, Ben, like we go on stage and we talk about this stuff. Like uh, what's landing with customers? Like what, what makes sense? What doesn't? And like there was a good chunk of time when I was out there and we were chatting about cloud computing and I was coming back to the engineering team and I was like, yeah, no one's getting it. Like no one, like no one's getting it. Like we got work to do here. Uh, but there was a, a pivotal moment that I remember where, and this was before we started talking about hybrid cloud, you know, when we were very much talking about like you got your private cloud and you got your public cloud and we hadn't yet figured out the need for this hybrid cloud. I remember talking to my engineers and saying, it's really interesting right now when I talk to like CTOs and CIOs and, you know, data center architects, uh, everyone has a cloud strategy and everyone's worried that they chose the wrong one. You know, like I would talk to people who were like going 100% private cloud and you could see that they were kind of going like, am I doing the right thing for my company? Like, am I like, am I being foolish with my money? Like, like, is this the right uh, long term path? And conversely, I'd go talk to people who were like, yeah, we're all pu public cloud. And you could see that they were kind of thinking like, but what if what if business needs to change? Like what if, like what then? Um, and that's really kind of the power of our platform is that we can say like, yeah, like do what makes sense for your business today. And if your business needs or your environment changes because pro tip, they will, then we can help you figure out how to get there. Congratulations for both getting through that entire presentation. We and that commentary without using the word synergy as well, because. You know. hey, and you've heard me do bad marketing speak. I can do bad marketing speak. Hey, we didn't say empowered either. <laughs> and I, I do, I like a disclaimer, I'm gonna say I never said this. So like this instance doesn't count. Not one super excited. Well, that's breaking the paradox. <laughs> And with that, thank you very much, Ben, for a very awesome and informative presentation. Yeah, always, always happy to chat about the technology, man. Amazing. I just feel like I've had this big trip down memory lane. It's been great. If you enjoyed this presentation and you want to come and chat about it some more, come and join us at aka.ms forward slash ops105 chat. And if you're interested in getting the details of this session and the other sessions that have been presented in our IT Ops Forks All Things Hybrid event, come and find us at aka.ms forward slash IT Ops Forks. Once again, thank you very much for your time, Ben. Thank you.